is good. Welcome back to the Uncle Sharma channel. Italy won, Wales nil. What another great performance by Mancini's man. And uh, thank you for everyone that's uh, that's joining in. It's uh, it's been an enjoyable Euros, right? How's everyone? How's everyone enjoying this uh, this Euros tournament? I'm finding it quite enjoyable. Yes, some of the big teams maybe are not playing great football, but that's that's international football for me. I'm never expecting great end to end matches, but that that Germany Portugal match was was great. And this today, Italy. How many good players did they change? I think it was eight out of the eleven players from uh, from the last match Mancini changed and yeah there was uh, there's hardly any difference this this Italy this Italy team as I said it feels like a club team it feels like you know Inter fans when we watched uh, Inter this season when uh, Conte used to swap out you know at the end of the season when we played you know Sampdoria all these teams and we were so you know big wholesale changes in the team and you know the the basics the mechanics of the team remain the same the dynamics remain the same the movements the uh, some of the schemes some of the the, some of the patterns of play they don't change, and you just see that with this Italy team, still very high quality football from the Italians, still you know creating lots of chances, and still another clean sheet. So we ending Italy ending this uh, this uh, group stage with nine out of nine points, three out of three wins, which is a record. It's never been done before by a team. I mean, it sounds it sounds like it, you probably you know you think like in the past that uh, I'm sure. France or Germany or someone, you know, in the past that must have done it when they won the Euros. You know, you think back in the 2016 France, you thought maybe, you know, this it's a doable thing, you know, three out of three wins in the group stage. But Italy are the first uh, team to do it, which shows, you know, how strong uh, this Italy team is. You know, it's not to be underestimated. You know, everyone keeps saying they haven't played, you know, big teams yet. They haven't played the serious teams yet, which is true. I've, I've, I also want to see this team against the, against the big team. I think the only big team we've played is uh, Holland, uh, Netherlands, uh, you know, last year. Uh, that was like, you know, a, a test against a, a bit so-called bigger team. But, you know, the way this Italy team is playing, it, it gives me confidence that I'm not scared of any any teams, honestly. You know, you give me Belgium, you give me France, uh, you give me England, you give me any of, the, any of the big teams that you want to mention, Germany, and I'm confident this Italy team uh, can beat them. And, you know, let's, uh, looking, looking at the stats as well, today um let's have a quick look at the stats i think once again showing the domination you know this wells team there was some changes in the wells team as well um you know it wasn't their usual starting 11 i think uh, ramsey was playing in a in a false nine kind of role um they rested a few players here and there but you know look at that complete domination once again like every post-match reaction i've done with rabona tv with sam adamo We've been talking about domination, and once again, 23 shots compared to Wales is three, six shots on target compared to Wales is one, 70 percent possession compared to 30. I mean, you know, you could say a lot of that was kind of you know empty possession, but you know, I felt like it was an empty possession. The the way Italy moved the ball is very purposeful. You're trying to find openings, trying to find space. 91 percent pass accuracy. Um, you know, just overall, it's just so 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 good finishing. With seven goals for Italy and zero goals conceded, so three clean sheets in a row. That's proper the proper Italian way. But seven goals are the other way. That's not very Italian. Dominating possession. That's not very Italian. Creating chance after chance after chance. That's not very Italian. So Mancini's managed to combine, you know, the way modern football is going. You know, keeping possession, creating chances, being dynamic, taking control of the game, but also keeping those Italian you know, traditions alive, you know, defending, you know, keeping clean sheets, you know, being proud of defending, keeping those things alive, you know, being really, you know, those Italian traditions. So best of both worlds, uh, Mancini, great, great work he's done. Let's see who's in the house, by the way. We've got more, my guy, Mo. We got we got to see you back on camera, bro. We're missing your analyses, your tactical analysis, your, you know, your general football knowledge. Um yeah, I hope to see you back on the screen soon on YouTube, Mo. Mr. Exposer says this year is better than expected. Yeah, I've heard a few, a few people say that that this year is better than they expected. Um, you know, I had my you know reservations because I thought maybe you know it's been long season. You know, the COVID period there was there was hardly any break for the players, so I was hoping you know I was fearful that you know these players might be tired by the time they get to this stage. But you know, it's uh, it hasn't happened, so it's it's good to see. Great shirt. Thank you, Mr. Exposer. It is, man. 
sexiest kit in the whole Euros, hands down. There's no competition. Best kit, the third kit, which probably we won't even see Italy wearing. To be honest, uh, they wore that crappy white one in the in the in the first match, I believe it was, isn't it? And um, yeah, this blue one is great as well. But this this green Renaissance inspired pattern kit is just so wavy, man. So wavy. Which player on the shirt? No, no one on the shirt. I don't usually get names on the on my on my shirts. I'm uh, even with the Inter ones. I don't I don't get. If I get, I usually get like a number because my favorite number is like seven or maybe I get ten. But I don't usually get names. But might have to, you know, if Italy win these Euros, I might have to get, you know, Barella. He's got he's chose eighteen Barella on this Italy team. Usually it's twenty three, but uh, you know, a Barella or a Verratti, uh, Verratti shirt. You know, it's in my favorite players or a Bastoni shirt. Might have to, might have to invest in uh, in one of the this biased British commentary. Is super annoying. Uh, it depends what 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 stream you're 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 going through, Darian. I'm not sure which uh, stream you're watching through, um, but usually, yeah, the British commentary is kind of yeah. Because I was watching on the BBC here in the UK, and they had the Welsh John Hartson, who's very Welsh, and you know he was he was crying when the red card was given to Ampadu, and that was. You know, in the in the modern day rules, how the game is played these days, maybe back in his days it would have been a yellow a red card, but now is that studs showing clearly missed the ball, clearly, you know, could have hurt Bernardeschi seriously as a red card. Um not, not much to not much to argue there, to be honest. Um yeah, clear red card to me. <clears throat> yeah, man, I wish that they'd be wearing this uh, this green kit more. Uh, is uh, is this yes the best kit as I, as I keep saying, but yeah, going back to the match. Thank you for everyone that's joined. Make sure to leave a thumbs up if you're if you're around here. More into the analysis of the match. Uh, I, I enjoyed I enjoyed this performance once again. This Italy team is so enjoyable to watch. Like if you're an Italy fan and you've been watching Italy like me for for decades, you. Italy teams have been good, you know, that 2006 team obviously was good and you could argue, you know, it depends on what you like to watch and that team, you know, being solid defensively and they had, you know, obviously had so many good players going forward that it was hard for them to not to be good going forward. But the way, you know, that 2012 Euros team was good as well on the Prandelli, they played some nice football, Balotelli and Cassano up front, Pirlo obviously and, you know, that, that midfield combination, but... This team, as you've seen, it doesn't really matter who's out there. This team, you know, if you've got Pessina coming in there for Barella, uh, Emerson coming in for Spinazzola, Toloi coming in, you know, Bastoni, Acerbi, you know, it doesn't matter who's playing. This team plays in the same way, dominating the game, creating chances, you know, just a nice team to watch. And they still have that intensity. They still work hard. They still defend as a team, you know, hardly giving any chances. Um, yeah, just uh, it's just uh, such a great team to watch for to me. Um, <clears throat> Samir says he wants to get Bastoni on his, yeah, yeah, but Puma, oh, it doesn't give you a printing option, that's weird. But you can get prints, um, you can go to like a uh, sports direct, I think they still do printing, or you can get there's still like shops out there you can get printing done. Um, yeah, it's quite quite easy, yeah, Bastoni, man, as I've put down below, Bastoni showing his worth. Interisti, we've been, we've been, uh, you know, the last match I was uh, saying with Adrian on Rabona TV that when Acerbi came on, when Chiellini got injured last match, Interisti were crying, you know, it was, uh, we were all hoping Bastoni would get some time. But I said, it makes sense for Acerbi. He's played with Bonucci throughout the qualifiers. It was mainly Bonucci and Acerbi. Acerbi's experienced, 31 years old. He's played for Lazio, he's played for Milan, he's played for Sassuolo. You know, it makes sense for, you know, bringing in cold middle of the match someone like Acerbi but Bastoni today I think he showed he showed even you know people that maybe not watch uh, Inter on a regular basis who just heard of the hype for Bastoni they saw Bell kept quiet you know Bell drifts out onto that right hand side where where uh, where um, Bastoni is or left hand side if you're looking at it from Italy's perspective yeah you know he put in some day Tackles, you know, those little fouls that probably could have been fouls, you know, the ones from behind where, you know, nudges him or elbows him, wins those headers. He has that dirty side of the game, you know, the, the proper old school defending side. But on the ball, the dimension Bastoni gives you is, 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 is absolutely second to none. So comfortable on the ball. He was basically like a left back or a left wing back at many points in the game. Um, we'll have a look, actually. Let's have a look at his, uh, Bastoni's uh, heat map. If, um, if who scored um, shows it, I think it will show how high up uh, Bastoni was. You know, the, on paper, it's a 
it's a four three three with the with Italy, but I'm sure um, you know if you see let's see the heat map for uh, Bastoni. Look at that! Look at look at the space he covers there. Basically, like a like you know the that's basically the position that he plays um, for Inter for for Inter and the Conte. You know that left centre back position because Toloi on paper is it shows as a right back, but just as we do with Florenzi and Di Lorenzo, that right centre back usually tucks in, and the left back, whether it's Spinazzola or Emerson today, is given the freedom to be pretty much a, a left mid or a left winger. And that left centre back is, you know, having to to play that position. I and mean, because Wales were dropping so deep, and you know, Italy were having so much possession. Bastoni was, you know, the amount of touches he had around here and around, you know, even that was just outside their box, and the amount of chances he created. I think he created like two or three chances with his crossing. We know that as Inter fans, we've seen Bastoni the last two years. What he can do when he gets up there, he's almost like, you know, he's just almost like a natural left back the way he plays there. Some of the balls he can whip in with that left foot. 93 touches he had by the end of the game. I think that's the second most after um, after Verratti. Um, yeah, so Verratti with 136 touches and Bastoni second with uh, with 93 in the whole match, you know, compared to the um, Wales players as well. So it just shows, you know, uh, probably if Bonucci stayed for the whole match because Bonucci was uh, subbed at half time. He finished with 61. He probably would have been second there because Bonucci is like that. Regista from defense, he, and he gets most of the ball when he's there. But when Bonucci came off and Acerbi was there, you could see that you know Bastoni took control of the game. He was the one that players were looking for. He was the one that was moving forward with the ball, looking for openings, looking for crosses, looking for passes. What a great player! And I think he's made a claim now that depending on Chiellini's injury, I think he should be the one starting. Uh, Bastoni with Bonucci and I, I was say I was saying that before I can see that you know if 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 Chiellini is fair it has to be the Bonucci Chiellini there's nothing we can do that's the tried and tested experienced those two guys know each other inside out it has to be Bonucci Chiellini if those two are fully fit but if Chiellini isn't fit I think it should be Bastoni I think he's made that claim and I think it's clear to see that he is he's the right choice and it makes sense moving forward for Italy with the World Cup coming through 2022 and in general, you know, Bastoni, 22 years old, you got to look to the future. You know, Chiellini, thank you very much for everything you've done, but it's time to look forward to the future and Bastoni is the future. So I hope Mancini in the in the coming matches, depending on Chiellini's, uh, Chiellini's uh, fitness, he goes for Bastoni. <clears throat> Talk to me a little about Berna. Hey, man, Bernardeschi, I was, you know... <sighs> I don't, I don't like him, but as we've talked about with Sam from the Calcio podcast uh, when he came on, he's a different player when he plays for the Azzurri. He had a stinker of a, of a cameo when he came on against uh, Turkey. But today, once again, he showed he's, he's a different player when he plays for, for Italy. You know, it, Juve, Juve fans probably wondering where the hell this uh, Bernadeschi is when he plays for, for Juve. He just plays with a different swagger, different confidence, I guess. And that's probably why Mancini... Mancini loves him so much. Uh, let's see what rating he was given here by uh, who scored 7.3. Yeah, this is not easy. For me, at a 6.5 out of 10 performance, you know, worked hard defensively, won a few balls back, created some chances, had a few wayward shots as he usually does, lost some, you know, dodgy balls here and there, but solid performance. And I don't like him, but. He does the job for Italy. There's nothing you can say, you know, he's a solid alternative, you know, obviously. Berardi is the guy who owns that right wing position at the moment, but you know Bernadeschi has made a claim, uh, and Chiesa as well. Chiesa made a strong claim, you know, with his directness, with his pace, um, with his dribbling ability. He's just adds a different dimension to the game. But I still prefer Berardi in that position. I still prefer that inverted winger, you know, Insigne on that left hand side and Berardi on that right hand side, both cutting in. Uh, I think it just gives you a different dimension, especially with Berardi's form at the moment. I think with Berardi and Chiesa, it's definitely 50-50. I'm, I wouldn't be angry at Mancini if the next match he goes for Chiesa. But I think with the way things have been going on right now, I think Berardi uh, deserves deserves to continue continue you know playing and um i'm happy i'm happy for these mid-table you know bowlers like Locatelli, like Berardi now getting a shine. And today Matteo Pessina. Maybe not mid-table, you know, Atalanta, not mid-table team anymore. They're, they're a top four team. But, you know, we were talking about it three or four months ago when me and Anthony made the team 
was it like two months ago, three months ago, when we made our team for this Euros, uh, I said, you know, we'll look out for Matteo Pessina being a late call up to the team because he, he didn't make the the teams that uh, the early teams with the with Mancini, but he made the last squad before the tournament and he managed, you know, due to Sensi's injury, due to Pellegrini's injury, he made it, he made he made his way in. And today he got the uh, the match winner in general. Great, great work rate as well. He's definitely up there in terms of candidates for 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 the man of the match. Um and uh, in terms of the man of the match guys, I can't look past my uh, Marco Verratti. He's probably, you know, my favorite player on this team because, you know, you guys, if you know me on this channel, I love technical ballers, you know, the likes of the the Sensi's and Verratti's of this world. I just love these types of players. Just so good to watch. With Verratti's always the, he's a, he's that he's that PlayStation, you know, if you have a PlayStation the controller, he's the one who, he only has the X button. He doesn't have the circle button, the shoot button. He only has the pass button. Um, and you know, today he had a couple of shots, but it's just uh, with Verratti, you see, every time he gets in the shooting position, he doesn't pull the trigger. But his passes, the way he controls the game, it didn't even look like this guy was out for like more than a month. You know, this guy's this is his first match since they uh, since PSG played Man City when he got injured, and it doesn't didn't look like it. This guy looks, you know, like he's always been playing. He played, uh, you know, full 90 minutes he played. I was surprised. I thought he maybe get, you know, 60 minutes or, you know, 50 minutes. But, yeah, clearly this guy's worked hard in trainings, worked his fitness up. They, you know, they, I'm happy that they didn't risk him earlier on in the tournament and, you know, gave him this match where, you know, it wasn't really important for Italy. But as we saw um, with Verratti, he um, he had the most touches. Uh, how many was there? Let me just share my screen again with you guys. He was just the, the 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 controller of this game, the the maestro. You know, when we talk about maestro, this is what it, this is what it means. You know, who scored gave him the man of the match? Quite rightly, he had the assist for Pessina's goal. Uh, let's have a look. Possession. He had the most possession in terms of you know percentage. Twelve percent of the possession was through him. Crazy. And then in terms of touches, yeah, hundred and thirty six. The next best one was Bastoni with ninety three. So he had the pretty much more than 40 more touches than the next best, you know. Everything was going through him. And, you know, Locatelli, great two matches, Locatelli. As we said, you know, been a revelation of the tournament. Everyone's woken up to, to Locatelli, two goals in the last match. But as I tweeted out, there's levels to the game, guys. There's levels to the game. And, uh, and I've always said in this Italy team, I think there's only a few world-class, truly world-class players in their position. Donnarumma. Is definitely world class in his position, and I think Verratti for what he's done at PSG over the years in that centre mid position, he's 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 a world class in his position, truly world class. Barella is working his way up to that world class uh, tag. I think you know in this uh, tournament, if he does it, that's it. The Barella's there, and um, you know the other guys, you know they're all there's, there's a few that's like on the verge, you know the likes of Insigne, Immobile. These guys are kind of on the verge of potentially being world class. Jorginho. He's definitely there after this season at Chelsea, but you know he's 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 one of the elites in this team. Verratti, he's 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 one of those guys that you could put in any team in the world, and um, depending on his fitness, I think as I said with Berardi, he has to be the guys in form right now. Locatelli in the next match, I think, has to start because of his form and because of Verratti's issues, and he's always had these issues. That's the main problem I had with Verratti. On Twitter, I call him out quite often. He's he's a little bit like Neymar. He's a bit like Sensi as well. Like this guy gets injured a lot, especially at crunch times in the season for PSG as well. Whenever there's a knockout stage, usually for PSG, I don't think this year he got injured, but he got injured against City. But in past seasons, he always gets injured at the crucial times for PSG. For Italy, he's missed every major tournament because of injury. Even this one, it looked like it was he might have missed it, but you know, Mancini was uh, you know thought he could uh, could recover him in time, which he has. So he was taken, but he almost missed this one as well. So with Verratti, you always have that doubt, a little bit like Sensi, um, that you know maybe he could get injured. These muscular injuries he gets, but as I said, man, to me he's one of the elites, and he has to he has to um, he has to be there in general. He just has to be for me. But yeah, as King Darian says, I love these injury-prone players. I've got issues, man. I've got issues. I uh, love these um, these uh, these uh, cardboard uh, muscle players. 
but what can you do man these these guys these are the these are the best guys the game man yeah we discussed uh why you know Mancini didn't pick politano moise keen um you know we discussed it with uh with sam when i went on his podcast just as the italy squad was picked live we were reacting to it live um you know politano's had a great season scoring 15 goals i believe or 16 goals for for napoli this year you know his career best season it's, it's a confusing one you know it's what a wild card you know you could have bringing like a politano with his pace and directness off the bench but with international guys it's just these coaches have their favorites it's just how it is you know southgate you know with england he has his favorites you know you clearly see you know he likes uh he likes his you know his mason mount raheem sterling whatever happens you know raheem sterling's had a bad season for man city but he starts for england because it's just southgate likes what he provides and he's he's loyal to him and mancini is the same with the with bernardeschi for some reason even though he's had an awful awful few seasons at juventus and especially this past season even got relegated to left back bernardeschi but he just he just likes what he provides for italy and he's a different player for italy and he does the job and he just can't yeah you know and with with moise keen there's been doubts over his attitude him and Zaniolo, there's you know they've been left out of squads in the past due to their attitude. I don't know, you know we don't. I'm not. We're not there in training to see what these guys are doing. Maybe Moise Keane, he didn't work hard enough in training. Maybe Raspadori convinced him in training. Um, I definitely would have took Moise Keane over Raspadori for sure. I mean Raspadori is at a nice end to the season, but you know only finished with like six goals this season. So that and uh, Moise Keane, I think had. 12 13 goals for psg so you know double the goals and you know he can play a variety of positions he can play on the wing play through the middle yeah that was a confusing one but baragi for palmieri again yeah emerson doesn't he's third choice not even second choice he's third choice for chelsea doesn't even get sniff most of the time um but you know it's baragi at the end of the day i'm not too mad about that one <laughs> to be honest uh but yeah there is rumors that kane was injured but i'm not sure um i'm not really sure about that one i did read that there was an injury issue but uh i'm not sure i just don't think mancini was quite convinced um in his uh in his eyes from uh sendo says bastoni man of the match yeah he's one of the he's one of the he's one of the candidates for sure he's one of the candidates for sure he was great but uh, he wasn't particularly challenged defensively you know i think for a, for a defender to be man of the match you kind of have to show something defensively you know some tackles but you know bail was pretty much not he was obviously thanks to bastoni playing well but he wasn't particularly challenged 1v1 or you know yeah i think uh, for bastoni to be man of the match he would have had to get maybe like one of the assists if balotti managed to reach that pass from bastoni or something like that i think he would have been man of the match uh, but i think it has to be Verratti for me in my personal opinion mo says if you assume barella will start which combination would you recommend between uh, locatelli Verratti, and Jorginho? yeah it has to be Jorginho is clearly shown that he's the he's the you know linchpin of that in that regista position. Barella on the right centre mid, and for now, as I said, it has to be Locatelli for the, his form and what he's shown, and because of you know Verratti's only still working his way up to fitness, so you, I wouldn't start him once again. But once it gets to the quarterfinal stage, semi-final, final stage, if we get that far, I think at that stage, as I said, there's levels to the game. And I think by that stage, Verratti has to start and his, his fitness should be back up to scratch. So that's, that's for me, that's, the, that's, a, that's, a, that's the best midfield. I know some people, some people think that maybe Jorginho even should leave the, you know, it should be Locatelli in that, maybe in that, uh, in that regista position or maybe Verratti in the regista position. But I think Jorginho shown that Chelsea this season, he's added, he's added that, you know, he's not the most physical player to the, to, in the game. But the problem is he has that issue in the Premier League where the game is quick. But in this international football, the game is a lot more slower. He's not exposed like he is in the Premier League, Jorginho. And uh yeah, the way he 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 he's he works around his lack of physicality, he wins balls back in a in a smart way. He's a very smart player with Jorginho. Um yeah, so he has to be he has to, Jorginho and Barella, I think, unmovables at the moment. Those the, those two guys are unmovable. And then that left center mid now is that position where you know, got Mancini's got much big headache between uh, Locatelli and Verratti. And for now, as I said, I'll go for Locatelli for his form, his goal, the goals he added to his game. But long term, it has to be Verratti. 
Yeah, and that that's the that's the thing with this Italy team as well. Great comment here from Indro. Combination play. So as we as we as we saw, team has completely changed. Eight out of eleven players changed today, but that that right hand side players completely changed. But that combination play was still on. Pessina making those off ball runs um, with with Chiesa. Chiesa finding him in space. Um, you know Toloi combining on that side. And uh, on the left-hand side, Jorginho combining with Emerson and with Bernardeschi or with Chiesa when he used to swap, you know, Chiesa and Bernardeschi kept swapping positions to the left and the right wing. Um, you know, those combination plays, this Italy team, it doesn't really matter who's playing. And that's why it really feels like a like a, like a a club, like a club team. So, yeah, Mancini's work, so, so good, man. Ritesh says, after Italy beats the next team, what's your take on Belgium versus Italy? Can Italy beat them with Lukaku, De Bruyne on fire? Yeah. Yeah, man. If you guys watch the Belgium, they're not looking most convincing, but the way De Bruyne came on against the Denmark changed the match, got that goal, got an assist. Like, you know, you can see the, the, the class of De Bruyne and Lukaku taking his form from Inter into this. Uh, I know he didn't get any goals or assists in the last match, but he created both those goals for Belgium with his with his work rate, with his play, um, you know, Conte's changed the, this this guy. Like he's he's become the full package. I'm not worried about him under under Inzaghi, but yeah, that that's gonna be uh, the next match. Should be from uh, as we talked about the previous uh, um, video with Rabona TV. It would be either you know Ukraine, Finland, or Denmark. One of those teams, which any of those teams, I'll take beatable. For Italy, and then the next stage is looking like likely to be Belgium, and that will be the first real test for Italy. But I can I can definitely see it's Italy beating those those that Belgium team. As I said, aging backline, shaky backline. Jason Denier not particularly great. Vertonghen not as good as he was uh, back in his Spurs, and even when he was at Spurs, you know he, he's a good defender, but he's never a solid. You know you could always there's always a mistake there. Alderweireld as well. Aging 32, 33 years old. That's an aging back line in general. Defensively, they're not particularly solid. And I've watched them, you know, Denmark create loads of chances against these guys. Not clear cut, but you know, they were they were running them, uh, they were they were having them worried in a lot of in a lot of situations. Um, you know, even against Russia, they weren't the most convincing defensively. It, at the front, you know, in terms of their wing backs, you know, Mounier. Is is you know he's he's good going forward, but defensively he can be he can be definitely susceptible. Thorgan Hazard plays as a wing back as well. On the he's definitely not a wing back. You know if he's if you get him one v one defensively, someone like Kiesa Berardi one v one can definitely beat him one v one. In the in centre mid, Tielemans or Witzel or Dendonka, whoever plays in there, that's not a particularly solid you know front to 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 to, to protect their defence. So. Yeah, that Belgium team defensively is definitely um, can be got at, and I think this Italy team can definitely score a few goals against them. But it's the other way that you have to be worried about Belgium, and that's where I'm interested to see if Italy can, you know, how Italy can do against the, you know, much quicker teams, much more physical, athletic teams. You know, having Lukaku, Eden Hazard, who's coming back on form finally for this Belgium team. You know, he's had an awful couple of seasons at Real Madrid, but for Belgium, he's looking much better. He's looking like he's a bit more fit. He's looking a bit leaner. He's not looking as chunky as he has been at, 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 at Real Madrid. Um, you know, De Bruyne coming back from uh, from that injury, that face injury. Um, you know, we know what uh, Carrasco is also very quick. Um, you know, he's a little bit more a direct option. Mertens, you know, as Serie A fans, we know what Mertens can do. Obviously, he's aging, but still, you know, nippy. That little kind of movement between the lines can always cause you trouble. Um, yeah, and they, they're a very fluid team going forward. You know, Lukaku doesn't just stay in the middle. He moves around all over the place. They swap positions. So, yeah, that one is, uh, I'm interested to see. So, like, uh, we've Because we've got an aging back line, you know, Bonucci and Chiellini as well. So, we're really interested to see what they can do. Or if, you know... Mancini opts for going for Bastoni against Lukaku because he knows Lukaku inside out. They train; they've been training together for the last two years. Having that, you know, right-footed, left-footed partnership with Bonucci and Bastoni, that'll be interesting. Yeah, but yeah, Italy can definitely. I can think they can beat anyone on the day. This Italy team they've shown it now. I think that France team, that French team, sorry, defensively they look super solid, and they're on the counter attack, this. 
Mbappe, man. They will kill. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you've got pace as a defender. He'll kill you. Matsumo's unfortunately found out. Mbappe, Griezmann, Dembele, Benzema. You know these guys on the counter attack are just gonna kill you. And they're so solid defensively. You know Varane, Kimpembe, Pavard, Hernandez, Yoris. You know solid block with Kante and Pogba. Rabio in front of them, you know, the, maybe individually the likes of Rabio, Pavard don't sound too great, but when they play for the French national team, these guys, similarly to some of these Italian guys, just stepped up to the next gear. Pogba doesn't play this good for for Man United, but for for the France team, man, he's a he's that baller that we saw for France uh, and for Juventus in the past. So. Yeah, I think France is really the only team I'm super worried about. But the way the when I'm watching this Italy team, Germany, Belgium, England, any of these teams, Italy can beat them for sure. Um, the only team, yeah, I'm worried about is is France. I think they're the best team in this tournament squad wise, but they haven't really been conv- that convincing on you know. But they're never convincing. Even 2016 when they got to the final, they weren't convincing. The World Cup, I was never particularly convinced by France, but. That, they just have so much individual talent, man. It's just crazy. It's just too. It's just too much. Hey, Mr. Ame in the house. Soon to be launching his Twitch channel. Uh, soon come, I believe. Who's got a better touch, Mancini or me? Yeah, Mancini still got that touch, but you know, Ame, my guy. He's a he's a goalkeeper, but he's one of those goalkeepers who's got a touch. So, you know, Manuel Neuer. Uh, yeah, it could be a close one, but yeah, enjoyed that touch by Mancini with a little back heel touch on the volley. Hey man, we talked about it in the last video. Turkey, the disappointments of the tournaments, man. The flop of the tournament, the donkeys of the tournaments. We were calling them dark horses. More like dog donkeys, man. These guys finishing with zero points. Zero points, only one goal scored. I saw they scored a goal and it was a nice goal. But yeah, losing once again to Switzerland. 3-1, I believe it was. Man, I've never seen a team like... They weren't that like hyped, but you know, people were. I was expecting them to like finish second. I think I predicted them to finish second, and man, they were, they stank out the tournament. You know, flop of the tournament for sure. Hopefully, their managers sacked for this performance because the their it wasn't just the performance; it was the, their approach to games. You know, they got nothing out there to lose. They're the youngest team in the in the game in the in the tournament. Just go out there and play your game, man. You've got attacking talent and you've got defensive talent, but yeah, Gunez just drop the ball like you know just saw nothing out there very disappointed by them man very disappointed um you know you know teams with a lot less talent than them like the hungaries of this world finland you know these teams are shown much more than this turkey team so yeah they definitely definitely flop at the tournament and yeah like as luke says it for parking the buses or you know you expect at least to get some some reward for you. if you park the bus usually you can get one or two chances on the counter attack but these guys trying to play counter-attacking football with 35-year-old Barack Yomas up front. Like, it does, doesn't make any sense, bro. Like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Spain. Nah, man. I've said it even before the tournament started. I, I look at Spain's team on paper. And then Spain, when I watch them play as well, just as as Samir says here, the, the yes is just uh, it's, it's in brackets because it's just pain watching them, you know, that possession football. But that is the way Spain plays a lot of empty possession, just possession for possession's sake keeping the ball but not really creating much um yeah it's not there's not very incisive the squad you know Morata up front Gerard Moreno it doesn't it doesn't you know strike fear into any team going forward you know Jordi Alba is their captain who's now you know 32 to what 33 years old and he's still like you know a big creative outlet for them uh, you know de- defensively they don't convince me you know Pau Torres and Laporte you know they might play Marcos Llorente right back, Simon in goal. You know, it's just they don't really have a a superstar player anymore. That Spain team, or you know, it's it's a, it's a nice squad overall, but I don't think they have uh, what it takes against the um against the bigger teams. Yeah, Portugal as well. Yeah, I forgot to mention them, but again, yeah, they play terrorist football against. They need a new coach now. Like you know, it worked out 2016 under under Fernando Santos. You know. Get, getting past the group stage, finishing third, barely scoring, getting past, you know, through extra time, penalties, and just getting that final, in the final game, that goal from Eder. So much talent on paper, so much talent, like the England team. But when they play, it's just, you know, they don't seem to click. I don't see good plays, good football. That Danilo, 
uh, that Danilo and William Carvalho double pivot just doesn't inspire me in the 4-2-3-1. Yeah, just awful team to watch. And we saw against Germany, you know, susceptible. They should be, in theory, solid at the back because they play such defensive football. But, you know, Nelson Semedo, very, you know, can be got at defensively as Gosens proved. But they're definitely up there. You know, let's, I'm not going to count them out. But if we if Italy come up against Portugal, I can, I'm definitely confident Italy getting getting um getting the result there because yeah i don't see much from them you know individually bruno fernandez Diogo jota ronaldo man there's so much talent on that team but they don't this don't convince me it's just yeah it's just it's, it is it just reminds me of england man if you watch the england it just reminds me of them just it doesn't seem to have that same uh, chemistry when they play together Trust the Italians with 12 without conceding. Yeah, hardly working. It seems like this Italy defense is hardly working. They've not been challenged defensively. Um, I think it was, yeah, as you saw, when Acerbi came on, he has having to play right center back. And you see, when you having, I know it sounds stupid, but when you're playing those two left of this center backs and one of them having to play on the right when none of them play on the right, yeah, you saw Acerbi missed that header and, you know, Ramsey probably should have done better. That was the only chance real clear. Oh, yeah, they had that bell chance as well, but. You know that mistake from a cherry could have led to a goal um and yeah that's that's pretty much it and you know that bail chance as well it was uh cristante or someone forgetting their man so you know this italy team you know if they stay switched on they they, they hardly concede any chances and um yeah I, then that was the issue i had with this italy team i was worried about them defensively even though all the stats were showing the opposite but yeah i've been i've been impressed with them defensively man Italy and Netherlands, the best two teams so far. Um, they didn't even go to the last World Cup. Um, I haven't actually, I only watched the Netherlands against the Ukraine. I didn't get to watch them in the last match. Um, uh, so I'll have to, I'll have to rewatch. But yeah, people are telling me they're playing nice football. You know, Frank De Boer shushing the haters sounds like it. But um, yeah, I've been, I've, I've been impressed with the, yeah, Italy's definitely been the most impressive. Um, Germany looked really impressive yesterday against Portugal. Um, yeah, there's not been particularly yet. Yeah, no one's really impressed in terms of their style of play, to be honest. Uh, you know, there have been individual players here and there that have impressed, like Isaac from Sweden's uh, really been quite impressive on an individual on an individual level. But in terms of team, I think, yeah, Italy's been the clear, clear standout team. You know, Czech Republic have been kind of in sprouts, just been quite impressive, but not, you know, anything stand out to me. Um, Croatia, Turkey. Yeah, with Croatia, I think it was quite predictable. That Croatia, this Croatia team is kind of coming at the end of a cycle now. No more Mandzuki. They don't have a striker like Petkovic. And they played, you know, in the first match against England, they played Brebic. He's not a proper striker. You know, they're really missing that Mario Mandzukic number nine in there. Perisic is now 32. They don't really have someone on that other wing. Modric is 35. Um, at the back, Lovren is just not very convincing. You know, Vida has just never been that great. Um, Rishaliko has had, you know, up and down. You know, unfortunately, that guy has glass knees. Um, yeah, it's just, uh, I think on paper, you could see this this Croatia team not particularly great on paper anymore. The, the names sound great, you know, still that midfield sounds really great on paper. Kovacic, Modric, um, Brozovic, but as we saw against England. They all like to keep the ball. They're great at keeping the ball, but who's got the goals in between? You know, we know Kovacic barely scores goals. That's always been his issue. Modric is not, you know, he's always, he's never been a particularly goal-scoring midfielder. And, uh, yeah, so I guess you could say they're a bit of a disappointment, but I, I personally could see this uh, Croatia team not being as good as they have been recently in the last few years. And, you know, I think that reaching the final of the World Cup in 2018 is the ceiling of that team, you know. It's, probably like you know a little bit overachieved and with that team so i think now it's regressing to the mean but you know hopefully they get more attacking talent coming through you know that small nation but somehow they they whip out talent all the time those guys it's mad um yeah spain has adama traore but they never play him the racismo but no i'm joking but yeah i guess um they probably should you know he's, he's a little bit of a wild card off the bench i definitely would give him more minutes uh, adama traore that 1v1 ability, the dribbling ability, that physicality, that pace, that power to open up some matches. But they just don't, but they just don't they don't do it. 
Um, it says they don't look great. The league made a difference, but he ain't hundred percent. And yeah, obviously you're gonna miss someone like Virgil Van Dijk. But I read a funny stat about Van Dijk. You know, everyone the last couple of years were hyping him up as you know this uh, greatest defender of all time. This guy's had zero appearances, no, in any big tournament. So that's gonna be a big uh, minus on his CV. Van Dijk. Uh, you know, he needs to get some big tournament experience under his belt if he, he wants to be mentioned with, with the big defenders before he retires. And obviously, yeah, shouts out to Pandev, man. Macedonia's youngest goal scorer. Yeah, Inter legend, obviously, uh, Pandev. But yeah, going uh, for just finishing off in the uh, Italy performance, guys. Uh, 40 minutes. Um, yeah, Verratti, man of the match. No real flop of the matches. Um, I was just impressed once again. You know, Pessina, great performance uh, as, a, as a backup. Belotti. Decent backup to to Immobile, but Immobile has to be the number the number nine for sure. Uh, Insigne will come back for sure, but good showing from Chiesa, good showing from um, from Bernardeschi, everyone, Toloi, everyone, yeah, even Sirigu. Sirigu got some minutes at the end. Did you guys see? That was a uh, Mancini trolling man, Mancini trolling, uh, giving Sirigu like three minutes at the end of the match, uh, subbing on for for Donnarumma. That was literally. Just a just a move for the squad, and you can just tell the squad. As I was saying, is it feels it's got a club feeling. You know, Mancini is doing a great job keeping these players. You know, giving everyone a chance. You know, Castrovilli even got a chance at the end. Raspadori got a chance at the end. It's just so good. You know, you keep these guys on their toes. You keep them involved. You keep the morale up in the squad. You know, you didn't need to do that for for Sirigu, but you know, as an experienced part of the team. You know, and I was moaning about Sirigu going to the tournament, but as we talked about with Bernardeschi. He clearly just is loyal to Sirigu, even though he was the worst keeper in Serie A this season, Sirigu for Torino. But yeah, he's clearly his number two. And yeah, shout out to Mancini. Looking forward to the, what this uh, Italy team can do going forward, guys. And um, yeah, thank you everyone for joining. 20 people here in the stream, 21 people. Make sure you leave a thumbs up before you leave, guys. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. Because I'll be keeping bringing Italy Euro 2020 related content. Hopefully bring in a preview for whoever Italy get for the next knockout stage, which should be someone, you know, Ukraine, Finland, whoever, Denmark, any of them I'll take. It will be interesting preview. Keep a lookout. Keep a lookout for the social media at Arshams on Twitter. Follow me if you want on there. Ooh, one more comment. Filippo, what's up, bro? Let's talk about this generation of young Interisti. <laughs> yeah, they are all Interisti, right? I didn't know. Oh, yeah, no, no, Raspadori, yeah, I did say he's a... Pessina is an Interista, yeah, he went to the Bernabeu to watch Inter. Yeah, it'll be great to see one or two of them end up uh, at Inter. Obviously, Barrella and Bastoni are already there, but there's rumours with Raspadori and even with Pessina, you know, he wouldn't be a bad shout for that midfield position, you never know. Uh, he's an interesting player. But yeah, guys, Forza Inter, but most importantly right now, Forza Azzurri, Forza Italia, and I'll see you for the next one. Ciao, ragazzi.